a very warm morning, afternoon, or evening to all of you, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to day two of AFA Connect, where we are talking about the power of communities. And in line with this overarching theme of the event, in this particular session, we are going to be talking about the power of synergies with other movements. Animal advocacy, as uh, we all know, we often tend to engage the most with organizations or individuals within our own movement, uh, which is fairly obvious, but it also risks the creation of echo chambers where we are just sharing similar resources and talking to the same set of people. But I think in order to drive lasting change, uh, a systems approach is kind of crucial, thus making collaborations with other movements necessary. So in this session, we'll explore how working together with other causes can amplify our efforts and create more sustainable change for animals. I'm so excited that we have three incredible speakers who are joining us today and uh, will be sharing about their work and the overlaps that uh, their work has with the animal welfare movement. But before we get uh, started, just a little bit about myself. So my name is Pavitra and I work as a coordinator at the Capacity in Animal Protection Coalition or CAPC in short, where we work with animal protection organizations in Asia, particularly those working in the farmed animal welfare space and support them in their capacity building needs so they can in turn support the animals more effectively. So yeah, if you are a grassroots organization working on farmed animal welfare anywhere in Asia, you can reach out to us. Uh, we'll share the link in the chat box below and yeah feel free to reach out to us then so um our schedule for this particular session so the session is divided broadly into four um four sections where we have three presentations uh one from each speaker and finally we have a 30 minute q and a um, section so please feel free to put down your questions whatever you have for the speakers even while they're presenting in the chat box and we have our incredible team who will be collating these questions for the Q&A session later. Yeah, and uh, so without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Magesh Swari Sangaralingam. Uh, Magesh, if you want, you can start sharing your screen um, and set that up while I introduce you. So uh, Magesh Swari joined the Consumers Association of Panang or CAP in 1992 as a researcher. She is currently the chief executive of uh, CAP as well as the honorary secretary of Sahabat Alam Malaysia or otherwise also known as Friends of the Earth Malaysia. Founded in 1977 to combat worsening environmental deterioration caused by rapid development, Sahabat Alam joined Friends of the Earth International in 1983. Mageshwari works closely with communities affected by destructive development and pollution, advocating for policy reforms to ensure environmental and social justice. Today, she will share her insights on work at uh, Sahabat Alam and explore the overlaps between soup, food sovereignty and the animal welfare movement. Over to you, Mageshwari. Yes. Thank you, Pavitra, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Greetings of the day. Oh, yeah, see, <laughs> my, <laughs> I think presentation just froze. So, Pavitra, could you help oh. with the, yeah. Yes, no, yes. No, not moving. Yes, I'll, I'll stop sharing, then you can share. Hi, okay. everyone. Um, So, Sahaba Alam Malaysia is actually a sister organization of the Consumers Association of Penang. We were established in uh, 1977. We are a grassroots environmental organization. Yeah, uh, which is registered with the Register of Society in Malaysia. And we are a member of uh, Friends of the Earth International. At the regional level, we are a member of uh, Friends of the Earth uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. Uh, okay, our we have two offices. One is in Peninsula, Malaysia, in the state of Penang. And we have another office is uh, in uh, rural Sarawak, uh, which is in the Borneo Islands. It's a small um, township called Marudi where we work uh, a lot with indigenous communities in uh, Sarawak. Uh, what we're advocating is for a development model that is ecologically sustainable, socially just, and fulfills the needs of the majority. So uh, I will uh, explain to you the work that we are doing in terms of the programs that we are working on. And uh, for in recognizing our work with the communities in Sarawak to save the forest in Sarawak, uh, we, 
Sabah Alam Malaysia received the Right Livelihood Award in uh, 1988. And we also received the Goldman uh, Environmental Award uh, for one of our offices in um, uh, Sam Sarawak, um, you know, in terms of protecting the forest. Uh, so we are also recognized by the Global 500 uh, United Nations uh, role of um, honor for environmental achievement that we received in 1987. Um, so what we are doing in uh, Sahaba Alam Malaysia, we work on a lot of it is on environment issues and we believe that we humans should be living in harmony with the environment so this also includes in terms of the uh, our work with on animal welfare wild wildlife habitat conservation and uh, other issues so we are also working on um, you know in terms of the protection of the welfare of the domestic and uh, pets uh, next slide please so in uh, Sahaba Alam Malaysia, we work on uh, six major programs. This includes forest and biodiversity, agriculture, climate change, development and planning issues, marine and fisheries, uh, pollution and extractives. Yeah, extractives uh, can be can cover mining, logging, and other issues. And um, uh, in terms of the activities, it's almost similar to all the programs. So we do advocacy, policy advocacy, and also campaigns to save uh, either certain forests or save a uh, community from uh, some destruction. Um, and what we need to do that is also mobilize the communities who are affected. Uh, we also conduct awareness raising programs, uh, capacity building programs with communities and uh, also like indigenous communities. We offer legal support for some of the issues that we are doing. We have to take it up uh, to, the, uh, to the courts so we do have legal support with public interest lawyers, and a lot of it also we need to highlight to the um, to the public. Yeah. So what we use is um, mass media, social media, and we also carry out publicity in terms of certain issues. And what is important, and we are, which we will be discussing today, is also in terms of the networking. Yeah. Um, and uh, our research is important. Publication of our research documents and also um, sustainable solutions. Yeah. So we have um, confronted a lot of problems uh, at the grounds. So, so what do we do? We also offer sustainable solutions that we work with the communities. So next, I will be talking to you about the our work. For each program uh, and from there you can also know uh, find out what we are doing in terms of uh, animal welfare yeah so our focus for our work program area on forest and biodiversity is to protect forests uh, against destructive activities so some might be thinking legal logging is fine yeah they will be following the rules but no some legal logging will also uh, no bring about illegal logging yeah, and also in terms of legal logging, also if it is in an environmentally sensitive area, it is also going to be destructive to the environment. Yeah, and what we are seeing in Malaysia also, there's a lot of um, mining which is going on in uh, forest reserves. Yeah, and uh, this is environmentally sensitive area. And when these areas, the forests are being opened up for mining or for logging or for uh, expansion of plantations, what we are seeing is um, wildlife poaching is also increasing. Yeah, and this is also leading to wildlife trade, and these are all illegal activities. Yeah, um, so whatever our work on biodiversity and forests, it also extends to ensuring the welfare of animals, and uh, what is important is also in terms of habitat protection. Yeah, and all our work is uh, linked to the protection of customary territory territorial rights, and also the welfare of indigenous peoples and local communities. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned just now, we have to work in harmony with the environment. And what we are doing is also, um, um, because some of the forests have been cleared, what we are also doing is community forest management. So we work with the indigenous communities and also local communities in terms of managing the forest um, by rehabilitating, replanting forest trees in the areas that has been degraded. Okay, next. Our work on agriculture is also to, uh, you know, besides um, fighting against monoculture plantations, which is also, you know, in, as I mentioned just now, it is also now they are high, earmarking a lot of forest areas to, um, you know, to be cut, cleared, clear cutting of forests is happening for monoculture plantations. So we are against that. And um, what we're doing is also protection of our traditional varieties of seeds. When we are looking into forest clearing, 
you know, our seeds are also being affected. Yeah, uh, not only vegetables and all that. We are also looking into the forestry species. So some of these forest trees are very important for animal um, animals, um, you know, habitat. Yeah, uh, for their food. Yeah, and um, other things. Yeah. So uh, what we're doing is we are promoting agroecology, which is also connected to our agroforestry work. Yeah. Uh, so next. In terms of the agriculture, our focus on monoculture plantation, uh, we oppose to two of the key destructive factors in, uh, in plantation expansion. First of all, is in terms of conversion of forests. Yeah, and uh, these pl plantations are either for oil palm, pulp and paper, or timber trees. In Malaysia, they are growing uh, timber latex clones. Yeah, for rubber trees, which um, later on uh, fell for their timber. And uh, these are typically developed by large local and transnational corporations. Yeah. Uh, and what we are saying is we are not opposing oil pump per se, because a lot of the local communities, the smallholders, and some indigenous communities, they are also growing oil palm trees. Yeah, this is for their livelihood. Yeah. Um, so what we are opposing are the large scale uh, clearing of forests, which is also destroying uh, wildlife habitat. Next. So uh, these are the indigenous communities who are defending their territories. A lot of them, you know, they depend immediately on forests, yeah, and also in terms of the for their food, for their shelter, water resources. What we are finding is once the forests are being cleared, you know, their food sources are also limited now. Yeah. Uh, so the co indigenous communities in defending their territories, they have uh, put up blockades. And they have also sent a memorandum, met the government, and Sabah Ala Malaysia helps these communities yeah, in terms of their, their struggles. Next, please. So another work that we are doing is also in terms of uh, climate change. We are doing local work uh, in terms of the adaptation and climate resilience projects, like replanting trees, replanting mangrove trees. Yeah, and we're also exposing the false solutions. Malaysia is really looking into carbon credits and also come up with ideas on carbon capture and storage. And some of these areas are also in environmental sensitive areas and also in terms of the, um, you know, in the seas. So um, we also uh, look into the National Climate Action Plans and we are part of the committees you know, to look, uh, get, you know, propose policy measures in terms of uh, climate change action that the government has to do. Next. So in terms of marine and fisheries, Malaysia, you, you know, we are a peninsula and we also also have islands and the government and also the industry are looking into you know, a lot of destructive activities near the coastal areas. Yeah? So this includes coastal reclamation, aquaculture development. So when we're talking about animals, we're not only talking about you know, um, uh, just the animals, terrestrial animals, we're also talking about uh, you know, in terms of the animals in the seas, yeah, the marine fisheries, all that. So um, they also deserve to be protected. So we are working with the communities in terms of protection of our coastal ecosystems. Yeah, um, and yeah. So what the communities are also doing is we um, we with the communities we are also rehabilitating mangrove areas which have been cleared. Yeah, and also um, no, for aquaculture activities mostly, and. Um, the communities are also protesting aquaculture activities. So you can see that we are doing a lot of protest actions and uh, some of it um, has been successful. Some we still continue working on um, uh, these issues and also to change in terms of the policies yeah, of uh, aquaculture in Malaysia. Okay, next, please. I'm just giving you a glimpse of what we are doing. Yeah, uh, also in terms of pollution extractives, as I mentioned just now, a lot of mining happening yeah, um, rare earth mining, which is also, you know, pollute uh, that are uh, illegal and also legal rare earth mining, which is polluting the ecosystem. Yeah, and uh, yeah, when when the ecosystem or the forests are being cleared, what happens is animals and also forest dependent communities are affected. So we are helping those communities. Next. So next work is in terms of the development and planning work. Yeah. Um, so we look into the physical, national physical plans. We in Malaysia we have a few levels of planning. 
So at the national level, at the state level, and then at the local uh, government level. So we look into the plans and also um, you know, come up with the suggestions or also objections in terms of the development planning. So this covers, uh, so our work on development and planning covers a lot. Another thing that we are also looking into are the destructive infrastructure projects that is being planned, large dams, nuclear power plants, yeah, and how this is linked to the protection of the rights of the communities and also animal rights. Yeah. So you can see we're doing a lot of work here. And you might be thinking we would have a lot of uh, staff working on all those issues. No. <laughs> What uh, we have is only about 13 staff in our um, full-time um, offices in our organization. Next, please. So how are we able to work on all these issues? This is through our collaboration and networking. Yeah, so we have collaboration at the local level, uh, at the community levels, yeah, and also at regional and, um, and, uh, and international level. Yeah, um, so at the local levels, uh, we collaborate with a lot of other organizations in terms of uh, to solve some issues. You can see some of the stickers and banners over here. Uh, Ulumuda is a huge uh, forest uh, area, which was, um, you know, there were plans to do helicopter logging. And then finally, it's other logging, which we help to, you know, save the whole forest from the logging because of the network that we had. We, so we have, uh, we had formed friends of Ulumuda to look into the issues and also do the campaigning, yeah, policy advocacy and campaigning. Um, another one is in terms of, uh, that you can see there is uh, Sagari, uh, Penyu Sagari, Penyu is turtles. So we have to protect that uh, final uh, turtle landing site in that particular state and that particular beach. You know, so there were plans to have industries in that beach and uh, through uh, postcard campaigns and all that, so we managed to stall that project. So now, right now, I think it's about 10 years since that project has been stalled. Uh, and every year we have to keep up the campaign and um, we made the beach popular as a recreational area so that people will also be involved in, uh, uh, in making sure that it is not being used for industrial areas. Yeah, uh, and another uh, pro uh, forest that we had also helped to maintain. You can see there were a lot of uh, animals in those forests. And once the forest is being cleared, this is a pit uh, forest which had pit swamp forests here. Yeah? Um, it will also affect the animals uh, besides the indigenous communities who are staying in the forest. So that campaign was also successful in stopping the uh, projected uh, development in that area. Um, Internationally, we work with the Friends of the Earth International. Yeah, besides that, we have also worked with Humane Soil Society International in terms of the uh, welfare of farmed animals. This we had a, a project on free range uh, eggs. We, um, you know, networking with uh, Asia for Animals Coalition. So we are not able to work on certain issues, but we at least we support the campaigns of um, Asia for Animals Coalition. Yeah, um, sign the sign on to the petitions and also support. Uh, letters and uh, every year there is a uh, on 14th of June there is a ban life exports day so we are very actively involved in that uh, campaign to ban life exports because Malaysia also um, you know we are also importing a lot of uh, life exports um, you know animals and the the condition is really very cruel yeah so we are you know campaigning to ban those life exports yeah so next so you can see that with very few staff, we are able to do all this because of in terms of our collaboration and networking with other groups. Yeah, and uh, the key takeaways is here is networking connects people. Yeah, um, and to create impacts and also, you know, we can drive meaningful change in terms of the policies. Um, uh, not only uh, at the national level, also at the global level, we will see because we are joining in terms of the treaties and conventions that we are attending. And so with more people who are mobilized, we can strengthen our advocacy. So the, our power of collaboration, we are also pulling together our resources. Yeah? Some of the things that we are working on, we do not have the expertise. So we also collaborate with uh, universities and also other researchers and other uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, you know, to you know, expound our knowledge in terms of those issues. Yeah? And um, we make sure that we have our common goals, yeah. And for your information, like Sahaba Alam Malaysia, we do not 
take corporate funding. Yeah. Um. So we are not funded by any corporation. So it it is mostly from grants received from um you know foundations and also other UN bodies. Yeah. Um. So with our collaboration, we can also engage with public. Yeah. There's an higher engagement. We can reach out to more people to raise awareness and also uh, stimulate their actions. Yeah. And uh, also, you know, through our meetings, our strategies and all that, we also prompt innovative lens on how to work innovatively in, uh, for, for that particular campaign. Yeah. And also look into new perspectives. Yeah. Um, and um, what you can do, uh, I can see that a lot of um, probably your NGOs or as an individual, you can support us and uh, also join our campaigns. Um, FA Coalition has a lot of campaigns going on. So you can join the campaign and also join any of Greenpeace or Sabah Alam Malaysia and Friends of the Earth uh, International campaigns. So thank you. Um, next slide. This is our motto towards environmental justice. All right, so uh, you can contact us for more information. Thank you. I'll be waiting around for questions if you have any. Thanks, Pavitra. Thank you so much, Magi. That was so inspirational and to think that uh, you're doing so much work with such little staff. Uh, it's 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 truly inspirational. Yeah, and that's through our networks, yeah, and our <laughs> activists, yeah. Thanks for yeah, that. Exactly. And I particularly loved uh, hearing about the work that you do with the farmers, uh, smallholder farmers, and I truly believe this is a crucial point uh, where the movement in Asia, be it the animal welfare movement or even the food systems uh, movement, uh, kind of differs from the global majority uh, more broadly, because um, in that we cannot achieve sustainable transformation of food systems here without bringing the farmers along, um, you know, on this journey. And so our strategies would have to incorporate uh, this reality uh, as well. All right, so yes. next up, we have uh, Mohammed Arisha, who is the global project leader for Greenpeace's Beyond Seafood campaign. He joined Greenpeace Southeast Asia in 2013 and leads projects to address overfishing issues in the region. Over to you, Arisha. Thank you, Fabrizra and everyone. So it's very pleased to be here. Uh, let me share my screen and we can start the discussions uh, i wish you can see the screen now the slides yes yes okay can. great okay so i would like to start uh really want to emphasize what uh maggie's already saying uh previously i think the power of the collaboration is really key and that's why also this uh sherry is really focused want to see how uh, the movements among movements, let's say, in the human right, uh, in the animals protection, in the biodiversity, could be seen and also collaboratively uh, working together, and also to maybe focusing uh, our effort to tackling the climate crisis. Yeah. So um, yeah. So just a, a couple of introductions about Greenpeace. Maybe for those that, that just heard about Greenpeace, so we are as the Global independent uh, networks. So, a couple of organizations. Uh, we call it. Uh, we have the official uh, entities in each countries. Uh, so far in South Asia, we are based in Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Manila, and also uh, in Bangkok. So at least we operate in uh, the region, but with the this four office. Yeah. So the the organization also funded uh, in. Uh, I think uh, started with the uh, focus on the whaling issues. However, we evolved uh, so much during the time when we can see it's a bit more on the uh, systems uh, focus uh, at this stage. That's why maybe in a couple of slides, uh, you can share, you can see how the campaign also uh, it, uh, evolved yeah, in many ways. Uh, so how we work actually, uh, we investigate for sure. This is a couple of main thing that we are doing in many offices and we do lobby with the governments even with the industries uh with the other civil societies uh and also with others movement and one of the key uh, dna that we are really uh, applying in our campaignings uh, is uh, to take the peaceful direct actions and last but not least that's really important also how we can uh, work together with the people and also among the movements uh, this is a couple of uh, uh, 
uh, campaigns that we are doing so far. So mostly, as you can see, maybe the plastic issues and how to deal with the uh, polluters. Uh, so we uh, focus on the uh, to make the polluter space principle and also working on the seafood uh, that we, I'm, I will uh, share more in the couple of slides. And you can see also there are in the global level also we work on the stop deep sea mining, how to save the oceans, stop the plastic pollution, and also to protect the oceans. So this is a couple of also that really important that we work also uh, to change the behaviors. So learn together and also yeah, uh, and working most importantly because I think it's really good. Uh, if there is uh, some question, how we can with the limited cap capacity with the limited uh resources, how we can uh, uh, expand yeah, uh, our impact. I think working with the volunteers is really key. That's why maybe uh, Greenpeace also really uh, work more with our volunteers in the uh, in these regions, especially. Um, yeah, I would like to share this one because this is maybe a, like a case study, how we integrate among movements. So, you know, Greenpeace really focus on the uh, biodiversity, I think uh, below uh, 20s, but after 20s, we do see there are a couple of things that we need to incorporate uh, in our oceans campaigns, not only to talk about the uh, IUU, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, but also how to protect the human right, to protect the fishers. Yeah? So that's really important. That's why uh, in a couple of years, we do see uh, if we want to win or maybe at least to address the overfishing issue, the pollution issue, and the climate change, we need also to integrate the human right uh, uh, focus in our campaigns, yeah. So uh, why this is really important in our opinions and our approach, uh, because as, as you can see, there is a really string uh, linkage between the human rights, labor rights, and also the environmental and sustainability. So this is why uh, the lens of the, the campaigns. Uh, and there are a couple of things that maybe we can, uh, you could maybe also reading further. So we also focus our effort how to, let's say, uh, in terms of the animal protections, we raise also the issues of the uh, shark uh, and also in terms of the um, uh, the seafood one, uh, we also focus on tuna. So these couple of things that we try to work with the uh, some of our allies, how to save the shark and also how to also address the overfishing issue in the tuna fisheries. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, also there are a couple of how we link this one with the human rights, and also working with the with the uh, labor rights yeah, uh, movements. So one of the movie that I really encourage you guys to see, maybe this is the uh, the movie that produced by Indonesian Migrant uh, Workers Unions based in Indonesia. We uh, really work working with them hand in hands. Uh, we share our strategy. We share our uh, frustration as well, for sure. But this kind of the how we can uh, bring the impact uh, to the communities by doing and producing also this uh, this uh, movie. We call it Before You Eat Movie. It's really important uh, when we can uh, link this one with the uh, the foods uh, uh, perspective, uh, which is I think maybe I will maybe discuss further also uh, uh, in the next uh, slides. Yeah, uh, this is kind of examples how we evolve the. So, for instance, in Indonesia, we start the campaigns uh, in 2013. For sure, without our allies, uh, we can we cannot uh, expand our impact, and also we cannot uh, synergize among others, right? So that's really important. Uh, even by when we uh, launch our uh, by uh, we launch our campaigns, we really focus on the alliance movements, and there are a couple of things that we have fought so far. So there are a couple of things that we uh, we focus on on the coalitions movements. Uh, for instance, in Team Nine, we focus on the labor rights. In the Coral, uh, is, you can see here is really focus on the sustainable uh, seafood. And the one I think is really important also to level up our uh, campaigns and also uh, advocacy by doing legal uh, uh, movements. Because legal is really important in our opinion. If you want to achieve something in the animal animal rights protections, I think also the, the legal aspect is really important. Yeah, how we can strengthen the legal system uh, in the country and also in the in the global level, for instance. So another kind of example, I think we do a lot also our movement with the youths. 
the working with youth is really important and i do believe in the animals uh, welfare or animals protection movement also this is really important to do and to is also part of the capacity building and also uh, public awareness yeah so for instance also in the brick free from plastic also we part of this uh, movement so from the beginning so i think in term of the climate movement and also how we tackle the plastic pollutions also against uh, i think the collaborations among movement and is really important uh, for instance in this global climate strike is not only talking about the climate actually we talk about the um, uh, indigenous people's movement we talk about the water's uh, uh, quality and so on so that's really important that uh, i think we need to expand also our horizons and also be ready to learn uh, new things yeah uh, uh, across the uh, across the movements for sure so one of example that we do with our volunteers so we establish what we call it Ocean Defender uh, Greenpeace uh, is really active in the region in Southeast Asia and also uh, in specific in Indonesia we also uh, uh, maintain the loud ID. this is like the community community portals by everyone can share the stories and also share their initiative yeah so everyone can join uh, uh, to write uh, their stories there um yeah this is really important uh, because if you want to really focus on how to make our uh, collaborations uh, effectively. I think so we need the, the most important thing is to see this perspective really comprehensively. So in terms of social, economic, and environmental aspect, that's something that really important uh, to be considered. And in terms of the animal welfare, I think it's really imp uh, it's really key. Yeah, in, I think I really learn a lot from this uh, five freedom for sure. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's not really new for the animals uh, protections um, uh, folks, but I think it's really how we learn uh, the the environmental movements with uh, with this one. I think this maybe uh, using the animal welfare concept. I think it's really important to also to be uh, communicate widely across the movements. That's maybe something that I learned a lot uh, in almost two years now. Yeah, how to see this uh, this uh, all connected. Yeah. And another one that I think is good maybe to consider in uh, nurturing our movements across the uh, across the coalitions. Let's say maybe to uh, apply and to talk about the one health approach. Yeah, I think it's really a, a good one. I think uh, will uh, also strengthening and also building uh, more uh, synergized uh, actions uh, in the field level, also in the governmental level. Yeah, because I think what we do is not only to change the in the in the uh, battleground level, but also in how in the global level. That's why I think that one health approach will be really important yeah, to be considered. Uh, last one, I think, uh, yeah, how to link, because I think it's really important when, as I said in the beginning, how to link this one with the food, yeah? So as, as you can see, I think this is uh, the emission that I think we, uh, yeah, at least in terms of foods, 26% uh, of the global emissions coming from these food uh, production. And if you can see also which one that from the food production sector, I think it's like livestock and also fish farm. That's why I think if, when we want to connect with this, uh, you know, uh, environmental movement, climate movements, uh, uh, animals protection movement, I think it's really important to see this lens as well. Uh, and also to understand uh, how we can uh, also address this issue because I think uh, the climate crisis is, is everyone's uh, business and to be tackled yeah uh, for uh, from uh, from many uh, of the movements uh yeah just to conclude at, uh, this is really important in my personal opinion to be honest if we want to strengthen our coalitions and also to make our movement effective to make the impacts uh, in the longer la in the longer terms i think we need to work together in the food systems yeah how to understand and also how one system, seafood system, terrestrial systems is connected each other. I think that's really important to, to have that uh, kind of uh, lens uh, uh, perspective. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. how to make the change? This is really kind of the models uh, that we uh, try to also working internally in Greenpeace. So uh, we call it uh, 3M. So one thing is to work on the mindset level. Uh, the one... Another one is to set the models, to set the uh, exemplary models. And also the last one that which is I think is really important to be discussed is also the movement itself. Yeah. So that's maybe how we can transform the change to be more transformative and long lasting 
uh, uh, change. So thank you uh, for your uh, here, uh, listenings. I'll uh, back again to Pavrita. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arisha. And that was really useful. Uh, and also it was interesting on how you incorporated the whole uh, model of One Health and sustainable food systems in your uh, in your presentation, because that is something that we regularly engage in, like the conversation around One Health in the animal welfare movement as well. And uh, to see that now it's being adopted in uh, such huge environmental campaigns and, uh, you know, work that Greenpeace is doing uh, is, is truly commendable as well. So thank you so much for sharing your work. And yeah, uh, if, again, a reminder that if you have any questions for, this, for our speakers, please do put them in, in the chat box. So next up, we have uh, Kate Razak. Uh, Kate works at the Asia Research and Engagement, where she leads research and collaborative engagement with investors at the Asia Protein Transition Platform to conduct shareholder engagement and advocacy with Asian food companies and banks towards a responsible and sustainable protein transition. Kate has expertise in food systems, farm animal health, welfare, one health, and alternative proteins, complementing a broader knowledge of environmental social governance. Uh, formerly, Kate has been the Global Head of Research for Animals in Farming, APAC External Affairs Advisor and Program Manager for World Animal Protection. Uh, she's also contributed to global strategies, campaigns and policy, leading some corporate engagement research and One Health collaborations along with prior government roles. Uh, she is a veterinarian and uh, she ha also has an MSc in Tropical Veterinary Medicine and examination memberships in animal welfare, epidemiology, governance and leadership. Uh, Kate is currently also a board director for the Australian Alliance for Animals. Over to you, Kate. Thanks very much, Pavita, and, and thanks everyone uh, for attending and, and for the invitation to present. Uh, I really love seeing all the campaign uh, images that the last two speakers uh, produced. And uh, I think my heart is really in campaigning. But uh, in this role, I have to call it advocacy. Uh, and really, we're working at the level of, I guess, corporate change in the first instance with some sort of, um, I guess, influence towards policy and regulatory change potentially. But we're really uh, we're not engaging at the consumer level um, for consumer change and so forth. But really happy that others are. So I just wanted to cover basically um, what we do across systems strategy and some synergies with some examples. And I absolutely endorse uh, the approach of uh, food systems collaborating and finding synergies between um, the animal welfare sector and and others. Essentially, uh, I'll just cover how we work, um, our systems thinking uh, are built into our Asia protein transition platform, linkages, opportunities and synergistic benefits and a few examples. Um, and I guess maybe some recommendations broadly. Uh, at ARE, uh, essentially what we do is uh, we do work across the ecosystem uh, in terms of consultation. So uh, just because we are not necessarily interacting or interfacing with consumers or the public doesn't mean we won't want to talk to organisations that are. And it's really, really important that we collaborate um, sometimes forwardly and sometimes covertly. Uh, so there's quite a lot of um, coordination behind the scenes as well increasingly. But essentially we directly engage with um, banks and food companies in, in, in our case. And we also have an energy transition program. Basically, what we do is shareholder advocacy. So we leverage institutional investors that have holdings or shares in Asian listed companies. So sometimes they're the subsidiaries of multinationals, but often they're actually homegrown Asian companies. And they're very much just uh, emerging, shall we say, in the welfare and sustainability space. But it's really important. And uh, I've spent most of my professional life actually living and working in Asia, and I've seen an enormous um, growth of both animal welfare, obviously alternative proteins and the whole ecosystem over time. So essentially we, uh, we try and further educate and collaborate, of course, with the investors, leverage their holdings. We engage and benchmark these companies and banks. 
We consult and coordinate and collaborate with NGOs. And we mostly act as a good cop, but we definitely have to know and have, you know, pressure points and bad cops out there. Absolutely. And I'm a very, uh, very big supporter of that. Shareholder advocacy is part of it so that we can sometimes escalate, send letters, attend at, uh, annual general meetings of companies uh, and so forth. But there are other awesome ways we can escalate as well. But it's interesting how much sometimes the movement doesn't think about the timing around, you know, board directors, um, decision making, finance, lending, banks and so forth. Uh, so wherever we can, we try and also uh, fill those gaps or work with others to help fill them. And we do do some research, so uh, I guess some thought leadership pieces, often some projections about um, the protein system, particularly and only related to Asia at this stage. And then we try and leverage other forms of collaboration. So this is uh, essentially uh, the URL to our protein uh, transition platform, which inherently builds in a systems approach. On the left-hand side, our main tenant is really actually to limit uh, the share of animal farming and particularly industrial farming and fisheries and to, of course, grow the share of sustainable protein, to which we very much include traditional and alternative proteins and some form of you know, regenerative agriculture potentially. And so we also require this these sort of thematic outcomes. So a systems approach in terms of traceability and transparency of companies. Um, we need to hold them accountable. They need to report publicly. We want them to reduce their antibiotic use and we take a more European approach as opposed to the US approach. Of course, we want them to um, think about their emissions and so we can leverage climate aspects, particularly if they're thinking just scaling up inevitably uh, more intensive farming. And we particularly focus, even where companies uh, are saying, oh, because of land and climate, we, we're going vertical, uh, for example, as in China. We just remind them gently, well, yes, you're still using all the same animal feed uh, and all the costs and impacts that are associated with that. We definitely uh, ask them about and care about responsible use of what we call natural capital. So that might be fish stocks, it might be water, it might be uh, obviously um, biodiversity and so forth, but also soil and other aspects of um, the ecosystem. We ask about fair labour and we care about how they treat people, of, of course, and just transition, as was uh, mentioned. But we find that there's very low level of understanding or discussion of just transition in the food system space. It's more mature perhaps for energy, but still a long way to go in both areas. And of course, we care about animal welfare and we refer to the farm standards, the Farm Animal Responsible Minimum Standards Initiative. Because we find that they are nice, concise, um, globally relevant standards that align with things like the Better Chicken Commitment and also um, uh, other uh, key standards that pretty much everyone would like. We aim for companies to set zero deforestation commitments or NDPEs, and uh, we want them to consider all relevant commodities. And we want this actually to increase the cost of business so that it makes it harder for them to do these things. But businesses are smart, and so they're finding other ways, of course, to reduce the need or certify and so forth. But in the short to medium term, um, this is definitely something that we also want to stop deforestation, biodiversity loss, of course, for people, uh, planet and animals. And then finally, minimising chemical use and, again, proponents of circular systems and so forth and reducing waste and plastics and, and pollution. So just that's a lot. I mean, there's no doubt about it. That's a lot. These are businesses just starting to get their heads around sustainability. So we prioritise. So along with the investors, we say, OK, climate is really important and interlinked with that is deforestation and, of course, biodiversity and nature. Some of the organisations we confer with, uh, Global Canopy, Rainfall uh, um, Action Network, Trace, of course, which is part of Global Canopy, others. We think about different uh, reporting frameworks like the Task Force for Nature and Financial Disclosure, Nature Action 100 and so forth, and see where we can find synergies across these other systems. We, of course, as mentioned, um, think about labour and just transition. And this is really important as well because, of course, particularly in the EU, along with deforestation, there's new regulations. We're seeing much more of a supply chain approach, uh, a greater due diligence approach. And this now means companies can no longer say, oh, well, we don't do it. 
or our tier one suppliers, we're talking to them. No, it's a supply chain approach. So if you buy beef in the Philippines, where does it come from? What feed is it eaten? Who's it impacting, et cetera? So increasingly we're socialising those ideas and uh, um, impressing the importance of a supply chain approach. And then, uh, as I've mentioned, the responsible antibiotic use. We can interlink this very strongly with animal welfare, and this is often quite important because uh, companies tend to sort of uh, neglect these areas in some ways. So we highlight these um, very strongly. And then one that I always love talking about is, of course, protein diversification or ultimately replacement uh, of uh, animal protein with some uh, non-animal protein. And this is quite exciting in Asia, uh, particularly in Singapore, where I used to be based, but increasingly across the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, China, etc. So this is a really fantastic area. And whilst there was a lot of speculation some years ago, it really is starting to become more solidly based, I guess. Uh, and we can, uh, again, of course, link with saving animals, but also reducing factory farms more broadly. In terms of what we do, uh, as I mentioned, we've got the platform uh, and we can do things like leverage sometimes, even if the investors won't do it directly as a platform, we can get them to support things like the new impact incentives, the book and claim process, which uh, Global Food Partners manages, and that can be used as an initial form of credit to help build up the cage-free egg system, for example. Engagement, of course, we can essentially link any of our topics back to animals, um, uh, whether it climate, deforestation, land, public health, waste, whatever. We have to be able to do that systems approach in our engagement. We want to be solution orientated. So we uh, we often provide resources and so forth, but in terms of the on the ground implementation, we just don't have the capacity to do that. So I'm always very happy to introduce other organisations that can lo locally, regionally and so forth. But there also sometimes needs to be that external pressure to make companies make commitments right policies and so forth. So engaging other coalitions like the Open Wing Alliance and others um, to get things moving. I've talked about the shareholder advocacy. It's not the same process as you might be familiar with in the US where you can just do shareholder proposals one up to the other. Unfortunately, there's very few markets uh, in Asia where you can do this, though Japan is one of them. So we have to be a bit more... Uh, amenable we have to be trying to engage them uh, we have to hold them accountable and there's a growing um, burgeoning I guess accountability sort of uh, movement in the animal movement and in the region and I think that's really important as well and as I've talked about our research we have to think about the system but a range of social and economic um, aspects to help drive narratives and why this is important for business and link in um, a range of different movements and sectors and we're constantly uh, trying to encourage and nudge policy because companies are looking to policymakers to help share the risk, to set the regulations, to set the direction for where they should be moving. Um, so that's really important as well. There's lots of benefits of these synergies, and I, I don't need to tell you, um, and, and I'm sure you can read some of them there. But uh, broadly speaking, uh, there is a, a general movement and we have to find sort of the synergy. Say if you reduce deforestation, well, that also helps you significantly reduce scope three greenhouse gas emissions, for example. If you improve animal welfare, well, that can really help you reduce your antibiotic use and so forth. So just a few strategic examples. Um, it's really important when we're talking to companies to build the business case and the narrative. And I've talked a lot about that, I guess. We try and engage them with building confidence with some win-wins. You know, how can we think of, say, welfare or, or even um, other aspects of deforestation and so forth that's actually going to bring them reputation benefit, maybe even productivity or financial benefit and so forth? We uh, think about what's on the horizon, what's actually happening in Europe, US, um, what other you know, global companies are doing. You know, we've now got major companies in the region that are in the top five dairy companies. They're the top five or top 10 pig companies or the top one pig company, biggest pig company in the world in this region. So we need to look at what their peers are doing, similarly with um, quick service restaurants and so forth. 
we the platform I've talked about that's inherently system based and thematic, and uh, the NGOs that we work with increasingly. But there's always more. We're always open to meeting people, collaborating, see where we we can be more more powerful together. The other thing we can leverage, of course, is, as I mentioned, the peer competition. Uh, so who's doing what? Who's set precedence? And this is why we also do our benchmarking. One of the things we can do sometimes is link um, others uh, like uh, Humane Society International many years ago uh, with DBS Bank, make introductions even with Malaysian banks to help get what we call sustainability linked loans so that small or medium farmers uh, uh, can get loans to have more humane businesses, perhaps more sustainable businesses. And we inherently must include animal welfare when we're talking about sustainability. The other thing we do is we uh, introduce NGOs um, to companies that have made or are thinking to make um, uh, commitments on animal welfare. So uh, these are some of the companies that we uh, are working with with others, some of the banks, uh, and then where external pressure has been key, like with Jollibee, uh, with QB at the moment, with the Open Wing Alliance, as you probably know, and with others, even if it's other organisations like Softer, like WWF and others, it just means they're hearing the message from many different directions, and I think that's really valuable. Practical change. Um, yes, again, we can provide... Um, uh, you know, I've, got, I've got some technical background and my colleagues um, can help work with that as well and translate it. But we might introduce, say, global food partners to work with companies in China to help oh, implement age-free okay. systems. Yeah. Can you wrap up in one minute, please? Thank you. Okay, sure. That's finished. Thank you. Um, or demonstrate examples uh, of, of sale group housing, etc. cetera. Uh, this is uh, some research that we launched last year, which is looking at decarbonisation pathways uh, towards uh, net zero, basically. Well, not quite net zero because we use the science-based target initiative um, parameters, but that is useful and it's got 10 Asian markets. So feel free to download that from our platform and, and look at your market and, and what it means. That helped to project basically a minimum of alternative proteins um, across different markets by 2060. And you'll see that this is quite significant. Um, so basically you know, 40 to however many percent um, uh, production of protein should be uh, plant or other alternative proteins by 2060. But also that peak factory farming must peak now or in 2030, particularly in certain markets, but all across the region. And just mentioning our base, our benchmark very quickly, uh, this is where in a radar graph we can really see how companies are doing, where they're weak on certain things and where we can uh, demonstrate that they need to uh, strengthen. Uh, networks, I think we've all talked a lot about that. We've just started working in India and I think there we're really embedding um, the networking right from the get-go, um, also assisted with the funder. And uh, in, in other markets, we have to work slightly differently in Japan and, and China and so forth. Finally, just a few recommendations. Um, I think, as, as the others have said, explore, be open to other movements, to synergy, to collaboration. Be really strategic, though. You can't achieve everything. Um, ensure that you can have a systems thinking in a narrative, uh, but clear roles and pathways for, for collaboration as well. Lean into some of the dominant narratives, um, but making sure you identify genuine champions for animal welfare because uh, that's really important to persist and, and make sure that they champion it moving forward uh, and over time, as, you, as we all know, it takes time. And ARE, we're a really small organisation, so we can't do things by ourselves, really. We all need to work together. So very happy to collaborate. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And always a fan of your work. Uh, I've heard your presentations before and uh, always in awe of the amount of work and the kinds of strategies that you talk about in your presentations and uh, the things that we use at ARE. Um, and I am pretty sure that a lot of organizations, even who are a member of AFA, would find your uh, presentation really helpful because many of them also work, engage with corporate uh, corporations and work with businesses and uh, the strategies that you've mentioned would definitely come in handy for them. 
so yeah um thank you for the presentation i would request yes. all the speakers to turn on your um, your videos and we can start with the q and a session we already have a couple of questions in the chat box but i think uh, a lot of them have been answered so let me actually start with kate because you touched upon uh, the last uh, point that you touched upon in your previous slide was informal coordination between movements and um, i also think that informal coordination between movements can actually be key for generating external pressure a lot of times and driving change so can you share some tips or strategies that you have used or seen uh, you know anyone use in your work where such behind the scene collaborations where you can't explicitly say that you've partnered with uh, you know an organization how can you effectively leverage such partnerships without having without making it public Sure. I guess we we'll, we we'll, well many of us do that. But for example, um, I attend the Indonesia Open Wing Alliance meeting um, in confidence um, uh, every month, and uh, this is a market that we've found very difficult. And you're absolutely right, Pravita. Many people are doing corporate engagement, and I would say sometimes more successfully than we are. So I'm not um, saying we're the experts. Uh, I think we can see what else is happening and what's where the gaps are, and we discuss the gaps. I guess. Uh, and over time, we, you know, it's encouraging, I guess, say, for example, if they feel they need to influence a bank uh, or they want to get access for more small farmers, cage egg farmers, for example, that's potentially something we can look at. Uh, if it's a company that we're not engaging, but we could be, um, if it's listed, of course, then we can look at um, writing to them, uh, engaging with them, uh, finding other ways to to. To connect with them and sometimes just there are companies that we can get a response from that others can't uh, maybe because you know we're coming under the guise of the investor holdings the investor relations other times because they might see us as balanced um, so you know they're the kind of things and then we can bring in um, solution orientated organizations but other collaboration might be you know when there was the the Jolly Bee campaign last year, which was ultimately very successful, um, you know, I just sort of said, oh, have, have you thought that their annual general meetings come up? You could use LinkedIn, for example, to, to target their board members, their, their directors and so forth. Um, and it's not something we can do per se, though we have worked with um, GCSCC that does uh, global, particularly climate and food systems um, communications. They have sometimes done that for us, uh, but that can be quite uh a good way so we can't document any of this of course but um we know that say a campaign might be imminent and so sometimes we can even just come in and say oh, you sh you're sure you don't want to sort of set up a policy or make a commitment on this you know but um yeah so it's that sort of informal stuff but ideally regularly so that you've got a sense of what's going on and it's broadly coordinated i, I would say that that's key thanks kate um so the next question is for you, Mage. So you did touch upon deforestation and land use, um, as well as, you know, your work with farmers where you are sort of pushing them to avoid monocropping and uh, adopt, adopt traditional foods and traditional plants that are already existing. So, of course, it's like food sovereignty and deforestation in general, uh, especially for animal agriculture, are critical issues uh, that intersect with animal welfare. Are there some examples that you've used or strategies that you've seen in the course of your work that, uh, that have successfully protected forests and supported sustainable farming while also improving animal welfare? Yeah, um, not in Malaysia, we have not seen. And Malaysia is not actually, we import the feed for mm -hmm. our animals. Uh, so we don't have large scale uh, plantations for, you know, to grow uh, agri-feed. Um, but what we are seeing is uh, the work that we are doing with the farmers, uh, some of them, um, you know, with, especially with the indigenous communities, they are staying near the forest. And um, they do also complain about how the animals are, you know, um, you know, taking their fruits. So what they're doing is uh, some of them have a different concept of it. Yeah, what they're saying is we grow the trees and half uh, there is a certain portion which is for the animals. 
and we harvest what we need. So they do uh, that, yeah, in terms of uh, living in harmony with the animals there. And um, what we are also increasingly seeing, uh, a prob which is a problem, is wildlife poaching. Yeah, so that is a very major issue. Um, this is also because in terms of how the forests are being cleared and, you know, there is the roads that is going yeah. to, nearer to the forest, so that is also increasing the poaching. Um, but with the communities, we can see that, you know, they are now trying to live in harmony with the you know, animals, uh, although sometimes they do get problems. So, and uh, what we're also seeing is like, in terms of industrial agriculture, there's a lot of pesticides being used. So that is why we are moving away uh, to chemical-free farming uh, to, in terms of uh, helping uh, protect the animals. Yeah? So some of the work that we're doing with the communities. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question is uh, for you, Arisha. And I know you touched a little bit upon volunteer uh, building in the comments. I read I read your answer. Similar to that, uh, we all know that Greenpeace has a global presence and uh, that, of course, allows for extensive collaboration. How do you, in your work, manage to integrate grassroots initiatives in your larger campaigns? And what are some practical steps that especially animal welfare organizations like grassroots animal welfare organizations in Asia take to effectively partner with um, a large entity like Greenpeace, which would be, you know, mutually beneficial for, for both the organizations. Yeah, thanks, Pavitra. Yeah, so I think it's really important also uh, when we say collaborations, uh, it takes time, energy. Synergy needs uh, energy for sure, right? Sometimes the collaborations can be doesn't bring us to anyone. That, that's really normal in terms of the coalition's work. I think it's maybe the ways, but I think the, the importance of this, the collaborations and the coalition work is the solidarity. That's really important part that we need to, to put at first because I think which is, this is necessary or not, we are together here because we are uh, in solidarity together. That's why uh, the, the first one. So I think that the, that the foundations of and the fundamental of the collaboration that should be put first uh, and also we have the common uh, understandings uh, how to uh, sharing the roles yeah because every organization even every person have their own weakness their own uh, strengths and also their own strategy for sure that's why maybe it's really good to to consider this one uh, to map out uh, what could be uh, beneficial and mutually uh, uh, agreed yeah by the members of the coalitions yeah uh, and for sure it's not very easy to <laughs> to work on the global, regional, and local. Uh, there is some tensions there always, but I think that's the, the, the nature of coalition, the nature of collaborations, yeah? So the, the most important thing is how to settle and to resolve it or maybe conflict resolutions within the within the coalition itself, yeah? Sometimes uh, if we don't really put that time, uh, I think maybe we need to uh, deal also with kind of difficulty to develop and to maintain the coalitions, yeah? Sometimes we need to lead, sometimes we need to support, sometimes we need to be listen, just listen. Yeah. So that's really important. I think uh, the, the the ways, uh, I think depending the the context, depending the regions, but I think the, as I said in the beginning, I think it should be uh, built on the uh, common understandings uh, in, in solidarity and why we are here together. This one is a really important point that we need to, uh, to be reminded again and uh, reminded again and again. Uh, across the journey yeah, uh, of the of the collaborations yeah and yeah um, part of one maybe it's good also to have you know regular evaluations within year based annual gatherings two years gathering kind of that what is i think that's really important to uh, to consider uh, uh, to make to make our learning journeys for the coalitions and the collaborations maybe bring the the, the change that we want to see together yeah back to you papita Thank you so much. And uh, you touched upon some really important points, especially conflict resolution when you're working with different uh, movements who might have different priorities, even if you are, you know, in the, in the end working towards the same goal. So actually um, connecting uh, the next question with the same thing. So what methods or approaches, and this question is, by the way, open to all three of you. Uh, what methods or approaches do you use to evaluate the success of your partnerships? And uh, 
how do you share these outcomes with shareholders, especially, uh, you know, funders? And uh, what my main question is that are the criteria for measuring the success agreed upon collectively with the partner organizations or does each organization have their own standards? Um, yeah, anyone who wants to go first. I can start if you like. Um, yeah, we've got we've got a collaboration going, I guess, for, with uh, a company in, in Japan. Um, we've tried to sort of agree the outcomes, what would be the goal. Um, and I think then, you know, a win is is getting that goal, whether it be a public commitment for cage free or actually or a hybrid commitment, cage free and plant based, for example. Um, not just when that should happen, but also what say the target date would be by what by what date or what would be the minimum that we would negotiate and accept. That's one thing. And then the second thing is um, attribution, I think you mean in terms of success. Yes, it's very difficult because as I said, you know, there's often many can be many organizations and asking for the same or similar things to a company. Then the company makes a decision, publishes a commitment. So I guess we're cautious about attributing uh, attribution um, and, and making sure that, you know, we're humble in that, I believe, uh, where it happens. Uh, and it takes a while because we work with large listed companies, not necessarily just on a brand level or a restaurant level or so, so forth. So it, it takes years. Uh, but I think we did try and develop a little system um, around that but I think it's not not perfect so I think broadly speaking you know acknowledging that others were involved it was a collaborative effort um, but basically celebrating that you got to the goal um, I think that's the idea but I think it's a to watch this space it's an evolving thing and, and we'd like to case study some of these things um, once they're successful um, a little bit more collectively too with the others thanks Kate um, possibly good next yeah, agree. Totally agree with um, Kate. And I would just like to add on uh, because we mostly work. We don't work with corporations, but we work uh, within the um, organizations. As uh, Arifsha had also mentioned, we are also part of this uh, plastics uh, work. Yeah, so we are part of Break Free from Plastic, and we also uh, in the regional level we have uh, at national level we have Malaysia Stop Waste Street Coalition. At the regional also level also we work with NGOs. But what we look into is the common goal. Yeah, and um, uh, in some of the networks that we are working with, we have a terms of reference in terms of how to engage. Yeah, um, and we do have in terms of if it's a particular campaign, what is our objective and what is the expected outcome? So we are le leaning towards that outcome. And um, so we do have our strategies and our activities that we want to look into, into achieving that outcome. And we do also have a time frame. If not, then it's like everyone is like, taking their own time to work on that. So that is not possible. So we do have a timeline on how you uh, when we need to reach that outcome. So there are the, as usual, you have the short term objectives and also the medium term and long term. Yeah. Um, so, but for this plastics work that we are doing, because we are looking into the uh, intergovernmental ne negotiating committee. So all of us are working towards that to finish up the treaty tax. So uh, that's a lot of work. And we have regular meetings, yeah. In and uh, since there are so many issues, so each thematic areas, we will you know have regular meetings for each thematic area. So that is important also for us to meet and trash out things. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Just adding, uh, yeah. I think it's really important the evaluation for sure. Uh, that's why maybe in terms of how we communicate our um strategy and also our wins for sure uh, i think one of the really key that that i think generally coalitions really want to see is actually join public statements i think we do a lot yeah for sure join press release join petitions so i think this should be encouraged more uh, and i think it's good maybe to to see whether uh, what kind of let's say join action uh, in the fit level something that i think something that maybe a bit less rather than maybe just maybe putting something in the website or maybe make some statement but i think maybe we can also uh, uh, maybe to see that how we can work together at the, at the field level yeah something that i think maybe that's uh, that's the 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 most important thing that maybe if you want to you know 
uh, to see how this app collaborations evolve, yeah. And maybe by working together directly with the indigenous peoples, local communities, I think that's something that I think we need to do more. Uh, uh, regardless, we want to work on the global level or regional level or national level, but I think to have some representative, that's something that I think we don't really have a lot in our coalition because maybe really hard yeah, to, to incorporate the participations, but I think one of our evaluations not is how we work together with the impacted communities. That's something I think we need to do more. And I think that maybe there are a lot of lessons learned that we can share together so we can uh, really get uh, the change that we want together. Yeah, That's maybe some of the, the thing that uh, usually we try to uh, address, uh, Pavitra, yeah. some challenge yeah, of the coalitions. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, yeah, OK, just one last question, maybe, uh, because we are kind of running out of time. But uh, so the, the question is mainly, I think it would be directed to you, Kate, and also to you, uh, Magesh. So as we work towards a more sustainable food system, there is, of course, a lot of interest in both technologies like lab-grown meats and alternative proteins, as well as promoting traditional foods and practices. And a lot of times there are these two schools of thoughts on which approach to take. So how can these approaches sort of complement each other to achieve the shared goal? And um, what strategies can you suggest that can help integrate both innovative and traditional methods to drive meaningful and inclusive uh, change for the food systems? Um, so, just to clarify, you mean uh, alternative proteins in particular, Pavita? Uh, questions. Yeah. Alternative proteins in UK, yeah. Or yeah. if you have thoughts on lab-grown meats, it's like... Sure, sure. Look, um, we're, we're quite clear to include, I guess, traditional plant-based as well as plant-based proteins. And then, of course, there's precision fermentation um, and also, yes, lab-grown or, as GFI likes to say, and cultivated meat and seafood and so forth. Uh, Look, there are pros and cons with all the different areas, uh, different types, I guess, but it's scientifically definitely shown that, you know, the plant-based are, are going to be the most, uh, well, I guess, energy, land, water um, efficient and uh, in terms of calories and protein as well, potentially. So for those traditional, um, they are low cost, as we know. They're beans, they're lentils, they're... Um, a range of, uh, you know, formats that we're familiar with, tofu and so forth, tempeh, of course, in, in this region. And then, but sometimes they are currently provided already and eaten with meat. Uh, so I guess there's the thinking that they need to sort of be some form of ideally replacement or diversification or reduction, say, in animal proteins, that approach. The plant-based proteins, of course, are the more recent, somewhat meat and, and and dairy and seafood substitutes, uh, but they're often more processed and so forth. And some people really uh, have concerns with that. Uh, a lot of them are not actually what people think are ultra processed. Um, and there has been evidence to show that they're not, and there's actually not a, a health uh, concern or risk with these um, uh, examples. However, they do have to be careful for fat, levels of fat and salt and so forth. Precision fermentation is much more expensive, energy intensive, but um, can still be really important. Uh, you know, we've got, we can have ice cream uh, made out of whey without dairy, of course. Uh, and then cultivated meat, uh, again, is really amazing because you're not using monocultures uh, in terms of crops. You're not having that. You can, in theory, dissociate it from climate, physical climate impacts, uh, but it's expensive to produce still, um, even though we're starting to see the prices come in, coming down. And it can be also hybrids. So hybrids are really important as well. And I think that's something we're going to see, starting to see more of um, hybrids with actually animal and plant, uh, which are not for everyone, but for, for the more the mainstream, of course. And then hybrids between, there's already hybrids available in Singapore, like 3% um, cultivated chicken and 97% plant-based. And so it might be hybrids with fat, uh, cultivated fat and, and other plant-based and other things. So I think it's really very exciting still. And there's a lot of really great 
Asian examples. And one of the ones I really love is um, Green Rebel from Indonesia. I just, I think their products are really fantastic and they're sort of mushroom and soy based and so forth, but textures and everything. So yeah, really exciting space. Um, there, I guess there's life cycle analyses and so forth. The one catch you have to be careful with the cultivated at this stage, unless you're using all renewable energy, it's not always more energy efficient, uh, greenhouse gas efficient than chicken and eggs, unfortunately. So if that element of using renewable energy in the processing and the scale up and production is, is you know, there has to be multiple approaches to ensure that it is as energy and climate efficient as possible. Sorry, there's probably others that want to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Okay. okay. So uh, we are more traditional. <laughs> Yeah, in terms of uh, looking into this uh, perspective. Um, so we also have a campaign in terms of reviving traditional varieties of uh, uh, vegetables or whatever. And we also have a campaign in terms of introducing, you know, back uh, of how you can get all those proteins and nutrients from plant-based uh, uh, products. You know, so they, they were like from traditional uh, varieties in terms from the grains and the seeds, yeah, yeah how you can um, have that. And um, yeah, uh, we are also against genetic modification or lab grown meats or whatever. Uh, and you can see that you know the industries so or looking researching on these now they are coming up with genome editing. Yeah. Um. Uh. And I think countries like Japan has done a lot of research on genome editing, um, including um, um eggs and tomato. But then we heard from a consumer group there in the um, cons consumer union of Japan, they have a campaign against this genome editing, and um, it seems uh, so. I I heard from them that you know one of the supermarkets sell, uh, saying that they stop selling this because they cannot explain what they are selling to the customers. Yeah. So in terms of genome edited tomato, whatever. So it's like we can't explain it. We are not selling it. Yeah, um, so that's why we have our campaign in terms of reviving all those traditional varieties, which could actually, you know, uh, provide us with a balanced uh, nutrients and balanced uh, food, your know, meals uh, for the day. That is what we are doing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think that's a very um, great way to bring the session to a conclusion. Uh, because of course, like both Kate, uh, you also mentioned that you do incorporate the traditional ways uh, in, in the work that you do as well. So um, of course, collaboration is key to achieving where we want to go. And uh, so if we don't have any more questions, I think we can conclude the session here. And I'd like to end it with this beautiful African proverb, which I bet all of you have heard before, but I think it never gets old. So it goes like, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. 